So in the previous video, we looked at the small population approach to population conservation. In this next flowchart, which we'll entitle Population Conservation 2, we're going to be continuing our look at how to conserve populations, just changing the way how we approach this problem. Previously, again, like I said, we looked at the small population. Another way to look at this and approach this conservation problem is to look at the declining population approach. So we'll do that over here. So in the declining population approach, we're going to be doing things a bit differently than our previous approach to population conservation. Here, we're going to be focusing on, and this type of approach focuses on, uh, the population in, let's say, a downward, focuses on population in downward trend even if not yet, let's say not yet, at that very important minimum viable population number, okay? So even if we're not at the MVP level, then we're still going to be focusing on this declining population because, of course, we have to conserve it somehow. Even if we're not at that MVP number, we still have to figure out a way to fix this downward trend. So this is a bit more extreme in terms of what you're trying to fix. Now, this type of population uh, approach, the declining population approach, emphasizes, it really focuses itself on environmental factors. So we'll write that down. Emphasizes environmental, uh, let me rewrite that, emphasizes, emphasizes ENV factors. Okay, so now that we understand that, uh, let's look at a basic example. I think a good way to understand this approach is to look at a good example, um, and we'll do that here. So our example will be the red cockaded woodpecker. Okay, red cockaded woodpe woodpecker. Okay, so what does this have anything to do with population conservation? Let's see. So in this woodpecker, we're going to first understand its natural habitat. It's a good point to start off whenever you're looking at any sort of population conservation. What is the natural habitat? The natural habitat is equal to South, um, Southeast America, so it's in Southeast America, Southeast American, specifically the pine forests. So this is our specific population in question. And over here, in this natural habitat, we would say, uh, the red cockatiel woodpecker, what makes it choose it? There are two main components that makes it choose this population, this habitat specifically of a pine forest. Those two main components are the following. It has what we would call a low undergrowth. This is something that a, a woodpecker, this specific woodpecker, wants. It has a low undergrowth of plants around pine trees. Plants around those pine trees because, of course, it's a pine forest. And so this is a necessity. It wants a low undergrowth. But interestingly enough, this low undergrowth is a direct result of something. This natural habitat has natural fires, okay? Natural forest fires keep the undergrowth low. So if we don't have these natural forest fires already, you should start be thinking, look, that's an environmental factor. A forest fire is definitely an environmental factor related to this declining population. So these fires keep undergrowth rather low, and who is happy? The red cockadead woodpecker truly enjoys this, and thus this is its natural habitat. This is the basic why, and then this is the reason why it lives there. So um, we're going to now look at the fact that the population is going to decline all of a sudden. And we'll say that the population declined, and this is actually what we've observed as a conservation biologist for today. Population declined because of an event known as logging. This is a deforestation event, um, and also because of the rise of agriculture, both of which are uh, contributing factors, reasons for uh, deforestation. So you, logging is just removing all the trees, removing all these very nice pine trees, agriculture is putting uh, large crop fields, let's say, in place of those large trees. And this is going to directly cause a fragmentation event. 
And of course, we know that fragmentation is not good. Fragmentation is going to cause smaller populations in smaller habitats and could lead to local extinction. So we'll say fragmentation of habitat. Once it was a large pine forest, expansive, wide, full of low undergrowths. These natural fires kept it everything okay. Now we've logged everything. We've added agriculture. We have some very bad fragmentation. So now there are going to be some key habitat factors to work off of, to understand. So let's write these down as key habitat factors. What are they? The key habitat factors, in order to keep this declining, in order to approach, let's say, this declining population, because look, the population declined. How do we fix it? There's a habitat factor that we need to do, and that is going to be controlled fires. There need to be controlled fires that are going to directly reduce undergrowth, as stated prior. These fires are necessary in a natural pine forest environment, but if that natural pine forest environment is altered by logging in agriculture, it's going to reduce the fires that are going to happen because there's not enough trees, let's say. There's not enough space for those fires, so we need to introduce controlled reduced uh, fires that are going to reduce undergrowth. And this is then going to hopefully, through this introduction of an environmental factor, of course, we're going to take this declining population and hopefully turn it into a viable woodpecker population. And that's the basic premise behind this type of approach. We understand that a population is continuously declining over and over and over again because of this logging and agriculture and fragmentation. We're going to take the environmental factor that helps this pine forest succeed uh, in housing this woodpecker, and we're going to take it and we're going to introduce these controlled fires to give us uh, what we have as a viable, hopefully, woodpecker population. Now, um, last thing to understand about population conservation is this idea that in this perfect world, yeah, this sounds wonderful, you know, to do this over and over and over again. Why aren't we saving all the species? Why isn't everything just being, uh, you know, perfect in terms of conservation and successfully doing conservation biology? Well, that's because we as humans have to face rather conflicting demands. There are conflicting demands in society today that are preventing this perfect world that we're establishing thus far. What are these conflicting demands? There's this idea of society versus biodiversity. So you might think, oh, you know, who doesn't want biodiversity? Uh, why would there be a, uh, a divide between society and biodiversity? Well, it's not necessarily in terms of biodiversity, but it's in terms of conservation. So it's society versus biodiversity conservation. So think of a basic example. This is a really good example to drive home this point. There's this there's this push to, let's say, imagine restock wolves. And this has actually happened. Restock wolves in Yellowstone. This is a declining population. And so conservation biologists will say we need to restock them. We need to bring these wolves back to their former biodiversity. And thus we would say that in the biodiversity realm of this, of this conflicting demand, of this argument, the people who promote biodiversity are, of course, very, very happy. So there's a nice happy face there next to biodiversity. But what about society? There's some societal uh, drawbacks to this. Society may not be as happy. They might even be angry at this scenario. So we'll draw society as an angry smiley, not smiley face, as an angry little uh, emoji right over here. And this is going to be because you might be wondering, well, who wouldn't want this? Who wouldn't want wolves to succeed? Well, very simply, people who are farmers, let's say. Um, we can say that this uh, hurts own, uh, it hurts uh, farm owners, this idea of reintroducing uh, wild wolves, let's say. It hurts farm owners, and it may even hurt people. Okay, It may even hurt people, because there are people that walk around Yellowstone that observe the environment, and you know wolves are not necessarily nice to people. So society and biodiversity have these conflicting demands, thus these conflicting little faces that I drew. And so it's not as easy as one, two, three. It's not as easy as just doing these approaches like we've been mentioning. It's a very multifaceted, complicated problem that we have here. Last thing to understand now about these conflicting demands is the ecological role of species. This is something we've talked about in our ecosystem lecture, the ecological role of species. 
This is something that we as humans don't really know. We have to ask ourselves what's, you know, the most important. What species do we really need to focus our efforts on? What's most important? And we would say, you know, with a bit of a, a hesitancy, you know, maybe the keystone species, is that really the right one? Do we actually know? That's why I'm putting these question marks here. We don't really know. It's a big question in terms of figuring out what the true ecological role is because we're just assuming. We're just hypothesizing and we're hypothesizing the keystone species. So that's an argument that society would put against biodiversity is that you're taking these assumptions and saying that these, these are the things that we need to fix when you don't actually know for a fact. So those are some conflicting real demands. This is reality that population conservation faces and the idea of uh, conservation biology as a whole faces uh, when we study this type of topic in biology.